Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Monday, October 16th, 2023. Larry Johnson joins us as usual on a Monday morning. Larry, no matter what we discuss, thank you very much uh, for joining us. But thank you. What, if, what should be the uh, Israeli um, first goal here? Should it be the safe extrication of hostages, or should it be the degrading of Hamas? Well, I, I don't think degrading of Hamas is an achievable um, objective for Israel. Um, I, I think right now we're, we're at a point that I haven't seen in my lifetime. And so, you know, going back to the 67 war and then the Yom Kippur war, uh, we're on we're on the threshold of Israel being isolated in a way that it never has been, in my view, uh, as a result of this uh, war with Hamas. You know, they keep it, they keep trying to talk about it in terms of tactical uh, issues. We got to defeat the terrorists without examining why is it that these people are fighting as they have been for seventy years. Now, Hamas is not 70 years old. It's, uh, you know, 30 years old. But it, the, the, the heart and soul of this struggle, it's really over land and identity. And they can't, neither side can kill their way out of it. And, and they, they refuse to come to grips with that. So, um, you know, right now, I think Israel would be better off from an optic standpoint of enlisting the assistance of Russia, China. Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, to try to find some way to negotiate their way out of this. But because every one of those countries that you just named <clears throat> is now, at least diplomatically, allied with uh, China mm -hmm. against Israel. Well, not against, they're not necessarily against Israel, like Russia, for example. Russia still has had a foundation of a relationship. Israel's actions with respect to Ukraine have put some strains on that. But you've got to bring, you're going to have to bring in some people to the, the side of the table that Hamas is going to want to deal with. And the the option for, you know, people say, oh, you're naive, the negotiation. Well, the killing that's going to go on, the way Israel is lined up, you see Israel, Israel's got, you know, hundreds of tanks, armored personnel carriers, their air force is, uh, has un you know complete control of the sky. They're fighting against Hamas, which doesn't have tanks, which doesn't have armored personnel carriers, doesn't have an air force, and is you know fires some missiles, but those missiles are not terribly effective. The images that will emerge from this will portray Israel as a bully, and as a malevolent bully, and it's what it's doing right now. It is inflaming throughout the Arab and Muslim world, the populations. It's igniting and rallying a level of support that, uh, you know, hasn't always been the case in, in past conflicts, like back in, in 2006. So, uh, you know, that's, I think, from a pragmatic standpoint of Israel's survival, that if they don't, if they try to handle this purely militarily and do the Battle of Leningrad, on, on the Gaza Strip, where they surround it and kill the population, regardless of civilian or because the, the Hamas is not wearing military uniforms. You don't have established bases that can be targeted as strictly military targets. And the, the Israel and, and Western supporters will argue, well, Hamas human shields. Okay, that that may be the case, but so what? It doesn't change the view of the people in Iraq, in Turkey, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Egypt, and just start going down the list. And th that's what I'm saying, that people are neglecting to consider what's happening with this uh, international coalition that's, that's beginning to form. So um, Israeli reservists have been using social media to complain. They don't have equipment. They don't have training. They don't have uniforms. Right. So is the Israeli army prepared for a, a street by street, block by block, house by house, urban guerrilla warfare? No, no, they're not. 
Uh, you know, the part of the problem with Israel is because it is largely a reservist force, sort of like our National Guard, they'll do periodic training. But the, the kind of training we're talking about required to take on urban combat is, is, is very intense and, you know, would encompass at least a couple of months uh, to, to really get units prepared for it. And then you're looking at taking casualties at a much higher rate than Israel has ever experienced. You know, the people are not appreciating the, the blow that Hamas delivered to the Israeli military a week ago Saturday. You know, during the 2006 uh, invasion into southern Lebanon by Israel. And the, Israel suffered, I think it was uh, 251 killed in action in, in that operation alone. It looks like Hamas killed well over 600 Israeli troops. And we're not talking some run-of-the-mill weekend warrior. We're talking some of the most elite personnel suffered casualties, significant casualties. So Israel right now, this has started off at a level <clears throat> of Israel losing more soldiers than it has since uh, the Yom Kippur War back in uh, 1973. So, th th you know, this is, th this is getting dangerous because uh, as... Israel continues to launch missiles into Lebanon and the Hamas and Hezbollah is launching missiles into Israel. That's heating up. Uh, you've got uh, Islamic fighters from other nations starting to move to this area and to, they'll be on the borders. Uh, Israel cannot and does not have the power to fight a two front war. It doesn't. And does it, we're, does we're, it know, <clears throat> does, does Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, who will reach to any height or stoop to any level to avoid being prosecuted himself or removed from office himself to unite the country behind him? Does he realize the danger that he's placing Israel in by his uh, defense minister and military chiefs saying we're going to decimate uh, right. um, Gaza <clears throat> and by one of the right wingers in his cabinet saying, well, who cares? They're not even human. They're subhumans. Does he realize the effect of that language on the security of Israel? Uh, I don't know if he realizes it, but I don't think he cares. Uh, this is, this is all about survival. And when you, put, when you put the narrative in, in, in the following terms that we are out to, the, these people want to exterminate us like the Nazis wanted to exterminate us in World War II. Therefore, we need to do everything in our power to defeat them. So that is, that's the men, that is the narrative, that's the meme, that's how they're organized to, to deal with Hamas and Hezbollah with no room. And yes, there are statements by uh, Hamas calling for the destruction of Israel. I mean, let's not pretend that, that they are, you know, Mahatma Gandhi out there put, trying to put daisies in the right, 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 rifles right. of Israeli soldiers. Right. Is is anybody but us pointing out that the Gaza Strip is an open air concentration camp, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, regulated and 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 managed and and suppressed by Israel? There are very few in America that are noting that. It is pretty well noted, at least once you're into. Uh, you know, what we used to call the third world or the global south, uh, particularly in Arab and Muslim nations, they are noticing. And if you've seen any of the images from the various protests that have that have taken place in Peshawar, uh, Pakistan, in Ankara, Turkey, in Yemen, in Sana'a, uh, what, what you uh, massive, massive numbers of people. You know, these are not paid protesters. So this is this is really resonating. And, and Judge, never in the history of Israel have they faced a war like what they're faced with now with social media. Social media is a real wild card in this because of its ability to get information out in a way that governments cannot control it. You know, in previous wars with the media are being controlled by if you're a war, front line war correspondent, you're still under the control of either the Department of Defense or the German Wehrmacht. But now with social media. Anybody with a smartphone can get out there, film it, uh, record some content, and then find a platform to put it up on. So what I'm hearing you say is <clears throat> at this moment in time, the Israelis are weaker than they have been, uh, less prepared than they have been, 
uh, and their uh, adversaries using freedom of speech and social media are as aroused as they've ever been. Is that a fair summary, yeah. Larry? Yeah. Well, just look the you know I I put an article up at Sonar Twenty One uh, the other day because uh, in my inbox I get this appeal. Hey, please give you know, give what you can so we can buy Israeli soldiers body armor. They don't have body armor. Mm. You know, think about that. You know, this arm the Israelis are getting, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars from the United States in military aid for starters. They have their own taxes to fund their own defense budget. And yet Nobody on the Israeli military side or the political side has ever has taken a, a moment to say, you know what, we need X amount of dollars to make sure that every one of our soldiers who's going to go into combat is outfitted with body armor. They haven't done that. Well, it's a you little know, late to do it now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, uh, the, the, the barn's on fire, the horse is out, uh, a little late. Um. Here's Jake Sullivan. You you, you and I and the people watching us now are not fans of his, but he is uh, telling uh, Jake Tapper on CNN that the Israelis uh, have a good idea where Hamas is. Um, I think you you, you, you listen to what he says. Actually, Chris, play both uh, links. So we have Jake Sullivan on the hostages and Jake Sullivan so this, it's the same interview uh, on uh, Israeli intelligence of where Hamas is. Hamas is a terrorist group. Don't get me wrong, but how, how do we know anything about what they're hitting, given the fact that it doesn't sound like any of the intelligence inside Gaza is particularly good? Well, Jake, Israel has known uh, where particular parts of Hamas's terrorist infrastructure have been located. They know, for example, where rockets are fired from, and they can go back to those locations to take out the rocket emplacements. They know from various forms of intelligence collection where certain individuals are located who are senior commanders in Hamas who are part of the bloody and barbaric attacks that took place against Israel last Saturday. Well, the president has been very clear that he has no higher priority than getting Americans back safe, Americans who are being held hostage by Hamas. The Israelis are right bombing now. the crap out and of Gaza, and, and, Jake. I mean, wh wh I, that, it doesn't seem like saving the hostages are a priority at all right now. Well, for President Biden, they are a priority. Uh, they're the highest possible priority, and he has sent hostage experts to coordinate and consult with the Israeli government on hostage recovery efforts. He's also made sure that our diplomats are in touch with third countries in the region to explore avenues for their safe release. I have to be cautious about how much I can say about certain efforts he's undertaking because we want to protect those efforts. So is it unrealistic to expect, Larry, that the Israelis could conduct surgical strikes to extract hostages? Is it unrealistic to expect that the Israelis could conduct surgical strikes to uh, degrade Hamas? Yes. Uh, short answer. Look, uh, what's funny about this, and I got a note from one of my intelligence buddies in the military. He said, when, when all of this started, that Israel said that they were bombing precise locations because they knew where Hamas was in the Gaza Strip. And he goes, let me see if I've got this straight. Israel didn't know that they were going to be attacked and all of their military bases along the Gaza Strip, but they actually know where the where Hamas is. And he says, yeah, that makes sense. And his sarcasm is, is spot on. But look, right. I was involved when I was at the, the State Department in the Office of Counterterrorism. We were involved with looking for the hostages that had been taken by Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. And we had task force. We had a high tasking of all intelligence assets, overhead photography, imagery, uh, intercepts from NSA, we, we had no idea where they were. And even if you can find out where they're located, the question is, what kind of force do you insert under, and, and, you know, under the cover of darkness it would have to be? And with all this rubble that they're creating in, in Gaza by blowing up these buildings, finding a landing zone for a helicopter is going to be a bit difficult. And he said, well, they can fast rope down. Yeah, they can fast rope down. But if they grab the hostages, 
they're not going to climb the rope back up. So, you know, just from a, from an operational standpoint, it's going to be very difficult. And uh, I think Jake Tapper's skepticism was spot on when he said, well, what, how can you say you're concerned about the hostages when they're bombing the crap out of Gaza? Uh, you know, it, it doesn't add up. I want to play a um, piece for you. Uh, um, this is uh, Ron Paul, Congressman Paul, uh, eight years ago on the floor uh, of the House of Representatives explaining why he's voting against aid to Israel, pointing out that the Israelis uh, created uh, Hamas and basically saying what you said uh, earlier, uh, that there's really no a military solution here because the hatred runs so deep. I rise in opposition to this resolution, uh, not because uh, I am taking sides and, and picking who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, but I'm looking at this more from the angle of being a uh, United States citizen, an American, and I think resolutions like this uh, really do us great harm. Uh, in many ways, what's happening in the Middle East, and in particular with Gaza right now, we have some moral responsibility for both sides uh, in, in a way because we provide help and funding uh, for both Arab nations and Israel. And uh, so we definitely have a moral responsibility, and especially now today, the weapons being used to uh, kill so many Palestinians are American weapons, and uh, American funds essentially are being used uh, for this. You know, Hamas, if you look at the history, you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel because they wanted Hamas to counteract Yasser Arafat. So we first indirectly and directly through Israel help establish Hamas. Then we have election, then Hamas becomes dominant, so we have to kill him. There's too much blowback. There's a lot of reasons why we should oppose this resolution. It is not in the interest of the United States. It's not in the interest of Israel either. Spot on. Yeah. Now, you know, we're right now, they're deploying an additional aircraft carrier, carrier strike group uh, to the Mediterranean. So we've got, uh, I think we only have a total of six aircraft carriers. So literally one third of our entire force is now concentrated in this one area. Uh, if this escalates uh, and Iran gets involved and Syria gets involved and, and even Turkey gets involved, um, those that carrier strike group could be could be at real risk, and you know, th th think the unthinkable that if we lose one or even two aircraft carriers, Ooh. And, and the consequence of this, this is going to escalate this this battle beyond what it is right now. Are um, the aircraft carriers <clears throat> sitting ducks for drones and other unmanned projectiles? Yes. No, they they don't have a very robust the, the, the Aegis. A system which is really not a very good air defense system, and uh, if you know if somehow Iran, for example, managed to get it get it get its hands on a hypersonic missile, uh, there is no defense at all for the carrier strike group against a hypersonic missile. Uh, it, it, it is a carrier killer. So this, and then you've got to step back and say, apart from you know, this is like some muscled up guy taking off his shirt and oiling up and then flexing muscles at, at a at a show. Uh, what is the carrier actually going to do pra practically? Well, all it could do is launch aircraft and cruise missiles that would hit and kill Palestinians. That is not going to strengthen the U.S. position in the world. It's going to make the United States a bigger target. We saw that in 1983 when the United States thought it was a good idea to shell Hezbollah in the Bekaa Valley of Lebanon. And that led to a response by Hezbollah, which you know blew up the Marine barracks and then blew up the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. So Here. you know, I, I think we could get into sort of that new kind of uh, escalation that we haven't seen for a while. Here's the Secretary of Defense <laughs> almost sounding like uh, your... Um, allegory of a muscle beach guy oiling himself up to show off. Uh, what's your assessment right now of the chances of Lebanese Hezbollah opening up a second front? 
Well, um, that possibility is always there. Uh, we would highly discourage uh, any entity, any country, any organization from doing that. As you saw, Nick, when, uh, when this happened, I, we rapidly moved a carrier battle group uh, into the region. And uh, that carrier battle group uh, provides us uh, with a number of options. So you heard President Biden say the other day that uh, if anybody's ever is thinking about this, you know, we would say don't. I think you're right. I, I, I don't know what good they're doing there, but let, let's, um, before I let you go, uh, move to another part of the world. Does anybody remember Vladimir Zelensky? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, 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 the world now recognizes that the spring and renamed summer offensive is over, gone uh, a failure, uh, that the Russians are actually beginning to move uh, westward and the Ukrainians right. are in a defensive posture. How much longer can this go on? How much longer can President Zelensky even, even last? And how much aid is he going to get when the House of Representatives can't even take a vote? Now, the aid is going to be declining, and the aid is a critical factor. Uh, once it's cut off, then Ukraine could last probably no more than two weeks. Uh, so as long as there's a trickle, they'll try to hang on in some form or fashion, but it's not going to stop the Russians from their advance, which is, you know, Russia really is on the offensive now. They're just not, they're not talking about it. They're not advertising it. They're just going about it quietly, and they're capturing, uh, you know, a significant number of Ukrainians who are surrendering to Russia. Uh, they've got another significant uh, force trapped in what they call a cauldron, basically surrounded. Uh, so this, uh, the, the war has completely gone off the rails for Ukraine. As you know, we, we've been talking about this for months, that this was right. the inevitable direction where it was headed. Uh, but now Israel is the big distraction. That's where everybody's focused. Just look at what happened. The United States took the 101st Airborne that was deployed in Romania, pulled them out and moved them uh, into, I believe, Jordan. So, and, and all of look at all of the F-16s and aircraft that the United States is putting into its bases in the region, uh, moving very fast, very dramatically. The United States never did any of that with Ukraine. How many because troops did we move to uh, Jordan? Does the American public know that we have troops on the ground in Jordan? And for what purpose other than to move into Israel? There, there is a contingency. I don't know what their particular uh, concept of operation is, but it was, I, you know, I read it was like two days ago that they, they pulled out the 101st and moved them. So they've gone from Romania. I'm not sure if they're in Jordan, but they're somewhere there in the region, and they've moved them there as a contingency in the event that if Israel needed to be reinforced. Now there is there is a message circulating today from another from a National Guard general saying that he, he's talked to his troops and the troops are saying there's no way in hell we're going to go fight for Israel. Uh, the, the, in fact, he said that there's a lot of anti-Semitic uh, sentiment being expressed among some of the National Guard troops. So, yeah, this like I said this can get this this is a mess. And the Polish uh, government, the the conservative government was just thrown out of office. Right. Uh, you know, Poland's sort of an, uh, an image, uh, of, or maybe it's an example of what the United States can become, or that's where we're headed. Because what made the U.S. unique was we had two strong parties. Now, some would say there's not much difference between the two, but at least one would rule or the other would rule. You never had divided government. Uh, the United States is headed towards a situation where, like in Poland, Nobody won a majority. You got to so you got to cobble together some sort of alliance with some people that you may not necessarily uh, fully agree with, and, and so the United States is moving into the, the the chaotic politics that has become characteristic even in Israel. Israel, Bibi Netanyahu didn't win a majority. He he won a, a he had a plurality of votes, but it was had to cobble together and cut deals with some of the most extreme right wing parties in Israel in order to get a governing coalition. And he's opposed by about close to 50% of the Israeli, uh, other Israelis. So it's, you know, that's, that's where our politics are headed. So Poland, Poland is sort of a, a predictor of, you know, what the United States faces in the, in the future, I think. Larry, always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on Friday for the Intelligence Roundtable. Thank you uh, so much for your time. Thanks, Judge.
course. <clears throat> More as we uh, as we get it. Please tell your friends to like and subscribe. Uh, we're up to 213,000 subscriptions. As you know, our goal is 250,000 by Christmas. Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom.